Anne Arundel County is a beautiful place. It's a really a microcosm of the United States, the fourth largest jurisdiction in Maryland. We're at over 580,000 now, and we have BWI Airport. Between Baltimore and Washington in that corridor, we have 530 miles of coast right up against the Chesapeake Bay. And of course, we're the capital of Maryland. People come here because it's got urban, rural, suburban. It's really a fantastic place to live. Our award-winning park system has 130 community parks and six regional parks. We have 7,100 acres of recreational land, 9,100 acres of natural resource land, and park systems for everyone that lives in and outside of the county. And Arundel County has done a good job of building our relationships with the community. That helps us make not just the critical decisions, but sound decisions, because we're hearing from a segment of everyone. There are really two things that I think are important for a government. The first is to restore trust. That means restoring trust between people, restore trust in what local government does. And so we've created a thing called Open Arundel, where the residents can go in and look at the performance metrics for every department of county government, and they can engage as well. We do budget town halls in every district, and we make sure that everybody's voice is heard. Thank you. And the other is to be healthy, health and wellness for us, our loved ones, our neighbors, our communities. And so I really measure the success of what we do based on health and wellness of our residents. In land use, we are dedicated to making life better for our residents in Anne Arundel County. Plan 2040 is the guide for the next 20 years to ensure that development is smart, green, and equitable. Smart growth is ultimately health and wellness because having the ability to walk, development is centered around transit, preserving open space and our natural resources. Anne Arundel County Department of Recreation and Parks mission statement is to create opportunities to enjoy life, explore nature, and restore well-being. We have athletic programs, recreational programs, child care services. There's something there for everyone, and we make life better. In Anne Arundel County, the Department of Health, we are here to prevent, promote, and protect the health of all people in Anne Arundel County and people who visit as well. So our Office of Health Equity and Racial Justice was established when we were looking at what was happening in our county and in the world. And what we saw was persistent disparities in health outcomes based on race, ethnicity, gender, income, and even geography. And so we declared in this county racism as a public health issue in November of 2019. And we formed this Office of Health Equity and Racial Justice to address those issues and advance them. The Anne Arundel County Police Department was founded in 1937. The agency is very progressive. All of our police officers are fully trained wearing a body-worn camera. We have two professors who've come in to help us journey through the history of policing and how policing has impacted communities of color. Having conversations with a facilitator about race and equity and diversity and inclusion just so that we better understand one another. We have our crisis intervention team where we partner a police officer with a licensed clinician. They respond to these critical calls for service where people are suffering some type of behavioral or mental health crises. So we essentially see them through to any resources that they may require, whether it be a psychologist or drug treatment for longer periods of time. So our team was named the crisis intervention team internationally. That's a huge recognition. So we're asked to go to various police departments to help establish their very own crisis intervention team. There are times where our county departments will overlap and we have a great working relationship between, you know, OEM and fire, Preeti Emmerich, we're rendering or offering assistance to help folks through those moments. The Office of Emergency Management coordinates the planning, response, and recovery to natural and man-made disasters. That involves a couple of steps. Number one, in the planning process, making sure we have plans ready. Number two, we exercise and train with our county agencies. Number three, when it is time to respond, we activate our emergency operations center. And then that's where all the county agencies come in and coordinate the response. And then the fourth step is really the recovery process. So after the response is done, there's still a lot of cleanup work. There's still a lot of community help that's needed and making sure all the county agencies are involved. One of our newest resources is Pepper the Preparedness Pup. We really want to make sure that children understand that to be prepared is the best thing. So to teach them different situations in a very simple terms. Today we are learning about thunderstorms. Do you know what to do during a thunderstorm? 
It's just the beginning steps of how to be prepared. Another thing that we all agree on is that there should be economic opportunity for everyone. As a lifelong business person myself, I'm very aware of the fact that what we do for our residents is possible only if the business community is behind it. The businesses are our partners and together, everything positive we do for our community is helping the quality of life that people of all ages and all income levels need and want. Those are things that we can deliver in Anne Arundel County and that's what makes us the best place for all. All right. Thank you for joining us. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Uh, some of you have seen that video already, and now you've seen it twice just tonight, once with sound and once without. But um, we, we showed that it was put together by the International uh, City Managers Association for the National Convention. At, at their expense, they came to our county because they liked what we were doing. And so they interviewed some of our staff. And I thought it was a, a nice introduction to um, you know what our priorities and our focus are in county government. Um, tonight is to hear from you in, uh, in District 1. This is the fifth. We have two more after this um, of these budget town halls this year. We've done them each year of our administration. And uh, I'm joined here by um, uh, not only Councilwoman Lacey, who's your Councilwoman from District, um, but also many of our staff who are here to listen. And so as you raise issues, I'm going to be writing them down. Councilwoman Lacey is going to be writing them down. And I can assure you that we have staff that are listening in that are also writing them down. And so, um, you know, we expect to hear about your concerns about public safety and all public services and public infrastructure, whatever it is that you think that this, the county needs to address with our, um, I will say, limited resources. So we have really tough decisions to make. And... Um, um, but I love coming. I love these every year. I wish we were in person uh, as we were when we started this out the first couple of years. But um, here we are in, in virtual again. So I'm going to turn it over first to Councilwoman Lacey, and then we'll have um, our budget officer, Chris Trumbauer, start to lead us through a, a presentation that we'll do as quickly as we can because we're behind schedule already. And then we'll turn it over to all of you. So Councilwoman Lacey. Thank you, Mr. County Executive. Good evening, everybody. I'm Sarah Lacey. I represent District 1 on the County Council. Um, I jotted down some quick notes for things that I hope to hear about tonight. I want to tell you that these are things I've heard from uh, District 1 residents over, uh, I would say, the past few years, um, since we haven't been able to be together as much this year. I'm putting them all together. We've made a lot of progress on the things that are important to District 1 constituents, um, especially in the areas of police, fire, and our teachers, and raising their pay um, and filling in back steps. Um, so I hope we'll be able to continue to support police, fire, and teachers um, in this coming budget. Our uh, next priority is a category you can sum up as being quality of life investments. Uh, what's the quality of life in District 1 and where are there gaps? What can we add to make it a better place to live? Um, so those are things like our parks, our park improvements, um, for example, putting in the dog park at um, Overlook um, Elementary or behind Overlook Elementary, I mean, um, you know, recreational centers and opportunities um, and also walking paths. We have a fair amount of disconnected um, neighborhoods in District 1. It would be nice if you could um, get from one place to the other without, not only without having to get in a car, but if you're uh, someone who maybe isn't so comfortable riding a bike on our public streets, uh, then, you know, walking on the sidewalk is your preference. Well, let's continue our investments there. Um, the other big ones are the Severn Intergenerational Center, which we've been funding for the past three years and um, we've broken ground on and now we have to, you know, see it through. It's very exciting. Um, and some infrastructure improvements um, with a uh, local projects like realigning race roads so that we have a safe intersection with 175 um, in Jessup. That's one that's been um, wanted for a while and is just sort of, um, I think, a bit, you know, lower down on the list, but we're going to be getting there eventually. Um, like, you know, other projects across the district, right? Everything has to occur in, a, in an order. Um, the last thing is that I have is um, hopefully funding the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Um, we know that that's, we know it's needed, affordable housing is needed, we need creative ways to be able to um, fund access to affordable housing and 
Um, I continue to, to hear that it's needed, but we also need to continue the conversation of how we do it. I think that's a very um, exciting conversation to have, and I look forward to hopefully voting for a, a nice investment in that area. So with that, I'll be listening. I'm taking notes, and I'll be happy to follow up with you later. Thank you. So Chris Trumbauer, our budget officer, is going to lead us off um, with these slides. And uh, I've got a few. He's got a few. And we'll get through them as quick as we can. Um, and then we'll hear from you. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. County Executive. I'm uh, sharing my screen right here. So hopefully everybody can see the title page here. We'll go through this quickly so we have time uh, to hear from you. Um, but as the county exec said, this is an important part of the process. And uh, this is our now fourth um, series of budget town halls. So um, just to orient us where we are in our budget timeline, it basically starts back in September, shortly after we passed the current year budget. Um, and where we are now is, is still in the area where we're deliberating and putting things together. And that's why it's so important that we're having these meetings now, because your input can still affect the budget. And that's very important to the county executive and the whole administration. But as you see here, um, we'll be coming up soon on our final deliberations later this spring. And then we introduce the budget on May first, usually, but that's on a weekend this year. So the county exec will introduce his proposed budget on um, April 29th on Friday. And then the council has 45 days to deliberate on it. And um, the auditor's office will take a look and they will pass their amendments and strike a final budget by June 15th. And that goes into effect on July 1st, which is the start of the fiscal year. So here's um, where all the money comes from that runs all the critical services uh, that the county provides. You see the two big um, chunks there are property taxes and local income tax. Uh, those make up the bulk of our revenue sources, but then we have all kinds of other um, smaller components, uh, real estate transfer taxes and uh, other shared state revenue, licensing and permits and so on. Um, but all that totals up to about $1.8 billion and that's what uh, we use to run the county. On the other side of the books, is where the money goes. And you'll probably notice the big thing here is our friends at the Board of Education. So they get a, almost $900 million of county funding um, to run the education system, which is uh, obviously very important. And then the next biggest category there is our public safety. So that's police, fire, and uh, emergency management and detention. And then going down the line, you see our other kind of core units of government service. The other two things I wanted to point out, a debt service, that's basically the interest that we pay on our bonds, and that's what we use to build things in the capital budget. And then the bottom three categories there, community college, library, and our court system, those are component units that, that we fund. They have a little bit more independence than a, a normal county agency. Uh, here's a little bit more detail on our Board of Education funding. Direct funding, $784.7 million. That's essentially just a check we send over to the board, and then the Board of Education uh, manages all of that. But then there's other county funding sources. We pay their debt service. Uh, we pay for the school health officers and nurses, and also school safety, which is uh, student resource officers and uh, crossing guards. So that's where the $896 million comes from. And as you see on the right, that's over half of our entire um, county budget from recurring revenue. So I'm going to turn it back over to the county exec to run through some highlights of this year's budget. On mute. Thank you. And OK, let's start with just basic fiscal responsibility and the, the condition that the county is in, which is better than it's ever been in the history of the county, I believe. We have ended each year um, because we budgeted carefully with a surplus. And uh, the economy did better this last year in particular. And so we were able to um, increase money in our rainy day fund, which the bond rating agencies love, put money aside for future bad economies, um, did the same with our pension fund so that we are prepared for um, downturns in the economy in the future by um, increasing the amount that we invest. And then um, when we do our capital budget, there are debt affordability guidelines. And when we came in, the county was overspending on its capital budget debt affordability by $76, $76 million. We got that down to zero. And in fact, we're able to put money up front, pay as you go on capital projects. I've spent 35 years running businesses and organizations, and I don't like to um, ever go over budget. And I like to plan for the future. And we've, we've been able to do that in the county. So next slide. 
public safety is, um, as, as you saw, other than education, the biggest part of our budget, and I would say it's the most fund fundamental obligation of government is to protect its residents. And so in the police department, we have increased funding significantly to increase the numbers of officers as well as their pay to get them up to the regional average. We've invested in a lot of technology for our officers. And the result of that is that while the region's crime rates have gone up, ours have gone down 11% on violent crime in, in 2021. And we believe that's because our officers are doing a fantastic job um, with the resources we're giving them, but we have more work to do in that area. Um, our fire department also, we were, we were in a hole and uh, we have been digging ourselves out in terms of adding firefighters, getting particularly more trained paramedics, um, which we've invested in and more apparatus that was getting very old. And so we're getting to the point finally where we're starting to meet the national standards on how many, how many uh, personnel are on these apparatus when they go out for an emergency. And um, um, so we have to continue to invest in public safety. Next slide. Education, we, um, we have invested certainly far more than previous administrations. We were thrilled this last year to be able to finally get our teachers back steps restored. They all were promised raises each year and during the recession, they didn't get them. And then after the recession, they continued to not get them. And so um, many of our teachers, especially the ones who'd been here with us the longest, were being severely underpaid. So they finally closed the deal on their contracts so that they're getting the money that we, that we budgeted for them. And um, we have more work to do on that front as well. Fortunately, the blueprint for education is gonna be a guide for us as we um, increase um, staffing and pay in our, in our school systems. And I wanna say it's been a very difficult time with this COVID surge with the numbers of teachers that are out, number of staff out and the shortages of teachers that we have. So um, lots of work to do there as well. Next slide. And then infrastructure is the other area where this county had fallen behind and needed to catch up. We had a school construction plan that there was no way we were going to be able to, um, to meet the, um, the timelines for. So we did the permanent public improvements fund in our first budget, and that created 250 financing for $250 million worth of capital projects. And that's allowed us not only to, to keep up with school construction, um, you've seen schools opening each year and, and more to come, um, but also fire stations and um, transportation um, issues, the Route 2 and 3 corridors, um, Ritchie Highway Route 2, and as well as Route 3. Um, bottlenecks that the state had promised for years to address where additional lanes and things were needed. Um, we put in our own money as a carrot incentivized them, brought them to the table, got contracts now, and just got notified that we are finally in the state's capital budget for those projects as well as others, and uh, in a great place to move forward with, with the federal money as well. So we have projects in the pipeline because we invested up front. Next slide. Um, on, on the environment, we have done a number of things. We created the first resilience authority, and we um, have budgeted to create the staff for that. That's gonna finance off budget, a lot of the, uh, the infrastructure improvements to protect our public infrastructure, our roads and some of our buildings um, that are gonna be impacted by, by storm surge and sea level rise. City Dock in Annapolis is the first of those projects we're working with the city on. And so um, moving forward there, um, created a new forest conservation mitigation fund for our public improvements where we have to meet the terms of the Forest Conservation Act. Greenways infrastructure plan um, with a million dollars added to, to, to increase the amount of green space that we acquire and protect, um, working on, on building out our infrastructure for electric vehicles in the county and transitioning county vehicles and a stormwater strike team in inspections and permits so that we can address the stormwater issues that, that we have all been struggling with um, in our communities. And then in your district, uh, here is a list of uh, mostly capital projects, a um, lot on Reckon Parks. Those are the ones that excite most of us the most. And uh, you can see that there are a number of those um, as well as some road improvements. Um, and uh, we can talk about some of that as we go forward. I know we'll hear about some of the things that we need to add to our capital budget. So I think I go back to Chris for the last part of this. Sure. Thanks, Mr. County Executive. Um, just want to let folks know generally what we're seeing when we look forward into the upcoming budget um, that we'll introduce at the end of April. 
Um, basically, things are looking pretty good. Uh, revenues are coming in so far uh, this year a little bit better than expected. Uh, we also have the federal fiscal um, recovery funds, uh, the, the American Rescue Plan Act that have helped fund a lot of COVID response things, and that's that's been very helpful. Um, so as we look forward, we project that the income, the revenue will be relatively stable. There's still some uncertainty because of the pandemic and uh, other global supply chain issues, um, but we generally feel cautiously optimistic. We are, however, concerned that, that some of that revenue um, will be offset by the cost of inflation and generally increased cost um, that we're seeing a lot of materials and other services. Um, in addition to that, we do have a healthy fund balance. Um, that's what we call the money that is left over from not spending it or that came in a higher than expected. So because of the good fiscal management that the county exec spoke about earlier, uh, we do have a healthy fund balance and we can deploy that in the budget through things that we call one-time expenses that don't have a recurring cost. Um, so we can use it to put in the capital budget or we can use it to buy equipment or things like that. Um, so if we look ahead to what we expect for the upcoming budget, um, there's some things we call non-discretionary increases. These are things we, we kind of have to pay for. So debt service increase and the um, increases in the health insurance and pension contributions. And then we'll be negotiating with our employee bargaining units. Uh, and then there's other what we call discretionary increases that are things we generally want to do, but we're not technically required to do that. Um, so that would include uh, additional funding to our component units like the community college, uh, we want to continue to enhance our health and human services programs to respond to the pandemic, but also to some of the inequities that the pandemic has exposed. And then, of course, all of our departments that are doing good work out in the community, um, they always have ideas on how they can expand their programs and services. And to the extent we have budgeting available, the county executive uh, likes to support those requests. Um, so this is a great slide. This shows us uh, in yellow on this chart. Anna Rumble's in yellow. And this is all of the current property tax rates that the 24 counties in Maryland are paying. And you see we're over on the right, we have the seventh lowest property tax in all of Maryland. We're under a dollar, we're at 0.933 per $100 of assessed value. And you can see most of our neighbors in central Maryland are either above a dollar or even higher than that. So um, we're looking pretty good in Anne Arundel County. And we also have a very good homestead credit that prevents the tax assessments from going up too quickly. Uh, so uh, homeowners are, are um, well protected in Anne Arundel. And then this slide shows the local income tax. And, and here we're looking even better. Uh, we have the third lowest income tax rate in, in Maryland. Uh, we're at 2.81%. Uh, there's only three other counties that are lower and they're very rural counties. Uh, most of our peers in central Maryland are at the state maximum of 3.2%. And we are considerably below that and very proud of that low tax rate as well. Um, so I'm going to turn this back over to the county exec so he can run us through the fiscal recovery funds. Yeah, um, we'll do this very quickly. CARES Act, you remember, was the 101 million that we got to address both the economic impacts of COVID and, and uh, the health impacts and um, COVID prevention work. And that is spent and it is accounted for um, fully. And uh, you can go online and see exactly how that money was spent. So that's gone, but we have the 112 million in the American Rescue Plan Act that comes in two installments. We got the first in May of 21 and the second will come in May of 22. Um, so it's cut in half. And if you go to the next slide, you can see how we have been allocating that. Um, next year's is not all allocated, of course, but um, almost half of it, about half of it is county operations. Um, and um, um, then the other half is mostly health, health and wellness work and food assistance, um, food distribution. Um, we're still doing eviction prevention. Um, a lot of the work of our health and human service agencies that that um, have really stepped up during this pandemic and, and filled some of the holes in our safety net are being funded by the ARPA ARPA money. So next slide is um, this is open Arundel and it's it's a place uh, where you can go and you can look at the performance metrics for every one of our departments. You can look at a lot of information on maps, the GIS stuff you can access. And it's really a great place for, for sort of budget nerds and government nerds to learn a lot about county government um, and hold us accountable. 
And that's why we do these town halls. That's why we do so many town halls. And that's why we provide all this information. So we have a team that we call uh, Arundel Stat of two people in our office that collect this information from the departments and around government to make it available to you. Um, so next slide. Um, the, you may remember that we had a budget tool the first three years, and we still do, where you can build your budget, but uh, we've enhanced that tool. It's still in the process of being um, put out publicly. There's some security measures that they have to have to put into it, but I just want Chris to show you a little about that so you can see how you can actually soon we'll be able to dig into the details of the budget without having to go to the budget book and look in all the charts and columns. Sure. Thank you, uh, Ken Executive. So this was uh, developed by our assistant budget officer, uh, Stephen Tarot, And what it does is it allows you to explore the budget a little bit more interactively. Um, so there's two things here. There's the uh, revenue and there's the expenditure. So this is just a demo to kind of walk you through it. But you can click on revenue and you can see these are the same thing we saw in the previous slide, just in different format. These are all the, the funding sources. And so if you want to click on one of these and you can see... Um, you know, we'll go in licenses and permits, and then you can see all the different categories. So we have permits, we've got our beer, wine, and liquor fees. Um, you know, we have trade language uh, licenses, animal control fees, and you can hover over it and get the exact amount and what percentage of the total um, category that is. So you can do a deep dive in this and get a lot of information on how the county uh, revenue comes in. And if we go back on the operating expenditure side, this allows you to do the same thing, but on the money going out the door. So again, you remember, here's our friends, the Board of Education. I'm not gonna click on that because it would just be one big square that shows the money we send over there. But if we were to look, for instance, at our Rec and Parks Department, um, they have a lot going on. And you can see here at the top, um, the different budget objects, which are the different categories. So we have personal services and contractual services and supplies. And again, you can hover over that and get a little bit more detail. And then down below, these are how the department is organized by bureau. So you see there's four different bureaus in the Department of Rec and Parks. You have parks and recreation and golf courses and, and director's office is their administration. So you can click on one of these and then you can get further detail. Here's how the parks Bureau spends its funds. Again, it's mostly on uh, personal services and contractual services. Um, so it really allows you to explore um, the budget. It's pretty cool. And uh, we hope to make that live in the coming weeks, uh, definitely before we introduce um, the next budget so that uh, everybody can explore their budget a little bit more. So that's a great demo and I'll turn it back to you, um, Stuart. All right. And, uh... So, um, yes, you can go to acounty.org slash your budget for all the information, um, as well as to provide more input if you didn't get a chance to speak tonight or you have something you want to add later. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Layla Jones, who is from our Office of Community Engagement and Constituent Services, um, your representative in, in District 1, and uh, she will be, uh, she'll let you know how the, the um, um, your testimony will be handled. And then at the end of that, both I and Councilwoman Lacey will um, um, not respond to everything, but at least give you some thoughts about what we heard uh, before we close it out. Thank you, County Executive. So good evening, everyone. Now is your opportunity to, um, to give your testimony. If you're interested in participating, you will have two minutes to make a public comment. If you see below at the bottom of your screen, there's a raise hand function. You click on that, you'll be placed in a queue. And then I will call on the first three names that pop up just so that you can prepare your comments. And then I'll call on the first name and you'll be, you'll, you will be asked to unmute and then you'll be able to speak for two minutes. You will see on the screen that there's a two minute countdown. We ask that you please be respectful and you keep your remarks to two minutes. And then after um, all the participants have had a chance to speak, I will um, send it back to the County Executive and Councilwoman Lacey to give their closing remarks. So far, we have five hands raised right now. Let me see. The first three are um, Gina Stewart, Joanna Berman, and Jennifer Stivers. May I please ask um, Gina Stewart to unmute? Good evening, Layla. Nice to see you. <laughs> uh, good evening, uh, Councilwoman Lacey and County Executive Stewart Pittman. 
My name is Gina Stewart, and I serve as the Executive Director of the BWI Business Partnership and the BWI Community Development Foundation. Both are small nonprofits in District 1. I would first like to thank you for uh, your leadership and uh, for funding our two LDC grant programs for fiscal year 22, one being our roadside beautification and the other our free county connector shuttle. I would ask to uh, continue funding both of these programs that are very important to the community uh, in fiscal year 23. Even through COVID, uh, for an example, our shuttle um, that operated uh, totally through COVID served over 55,000 passengers in FY21, and our numbers are continuing to grow this fiscal year. This is helpful for those that don't have transportation to get to jobs and to job opportunities. And so for uh, my ask, I guess, is that I would like to stress, you know, we saw on the chart that the Office of Transportation is a very small little blip uh, as part of the whole county budget. So I'm asking um, the council and um, County Executive Pittman if, to please consider increasing the operating and the capital budget for the Office of Transportation so that they can leverage more state and federal funding uh, to help our community uh, move around and uh, be able to help those that are seeking job opportunities as well that don't have transportation. So I thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you, Gina. Next we have um, Joanna Furman. Hi, my name is Joanna Furman. I'm a District 1 resident, and I've been a volunteer at Anne Arundel County Animal Care and Control for seven years. I'm also a board member of the nonprofit that volunteers created in 2014 to support the shelter. Thank you for holding these budget town halls and for acting on many of our previous requests. There still are important things left to be done. They include hiring a full-time staff veterinarian, funding medical equipment for the shelter's clinic, and increasing its medical budget. Oh, and of course, purchasing a livestock trailer so the shelter doesn't have to look around for transportation every time it needs to move a cow or pig or other larger animal. I'd like to ask you to begin planning for a big capital improvement item, a new shelter building. You have both visited the existing 22-year-old shelter. As you might recall, it has floors that tilt this way and that, drains that go nowhere, walls that don't touch the floor, and a layout that at best can be called a maze. Cats in the main cat room are terrified because their cages are next to the entrance to a room filled with barking dogs. The area where new animals arrive also has no separation between cats and dogs. Frequently, there are many wire cages of new cats sitting on the floor right next to very anxious new dogs who are being checked in. This violates animal shelter guidelines. Other shelters in our area, including the ones for Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Montgomery County, and Calvert County have recently built new facilities. In fact, when Barks moved to its new shelter, our volunteers spent a day scrounging through its old building for hand-me-downs that Anne Arundel Shelter could use. So while we'll keep scrounging, it's time to start planning for a new shelter for our county as well. Thank you for listening and for supporting animal care and control. Thank you, Joanna. Next, we have Jennifer Stivers. Hello. Can you hear me? <laughs> um, yes, we can. All right. Um, good evening. I'm Jennifer Stivers, a resident of District 1. For the last five years, I've been a volunteer, foster, and transporter for Anne Arundel County Animal Care and Control. Thank you for allowing the county residents the opportunity to conveniently express their opinions regarding the next budget cycle. I am urging the council to please fund the shelter to purchase dental x-ray and dental cleaning equipment in conjunction with hiring a full-time staff veterinarian. I know firsthand how important dental care is to animals' health and well-being, having two cats who had severe stomatitis and gingivitis. Based on my experience, the majority of adult animals that the shelter receives have not had proper dental care in the past, resulting in the need for multiple extractions and antibiotics to quell infection. Being an adopter myself, I know that an animal requiring $500 to $2,000 in immediate medical care upon adoption is not a great selling point. On the contrary, having recent medical care makes an animal more adoptable, resulting in shorter shelter stays. I frequently transport cats about an hour round trip to outside vets for this type of care, which Friends of Anne Arundel County Animal Care and Control has 
graciously funded in the past due to county budget limitations. Having this equipment in-house would produce return on investment. It would reduce the administrative workload of the veterinary technicians and kennel supervisor who book appointments and arrange for transport of the animals to their appointments, allowing them to physically uh, focus on caring for the animals. It would allow the animal to receive more immediate medical attention as local vets are extremely busy and sometimes are booked several weeks out. It would reduce the stress of animals who don't necessarily all enjoy the car rides to the vet. It would give volunteers their time back to focus on animal enrichment and other shelter needs. It would free up friends donors funding to support other important initiatives. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Jennifer. Our next three are Mike Shear, Asia Rodriguez, and Ashley R. Mike, you're next. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Good evening. I'm Mike Shire. I'm from the Anne Arundel County Fraternal Order of Police, representing the active and retired police officers from Anne Arundel County Police. Um, I think I heard our friends in the fire service demonstrating their hard work in the background when the county executive was speaking, so shout out to them. Um, I do want to thank County Executive Pittman and Councilwoman Lacey for the opportunity to speak with you all tonight. And we appreciate both of you speaking in favor of continuing to invest in public safety for our county. Our county police officers, as everybody knows, are out on the street, pandemic or not, providing unparalleled service to our communities. Even at fully budgeted strength, we operate with staffing levels well below our neighboring comparable jurisdictions. This means as a practical matter, our officers are burdened with the responsibility of performing like two or three officers from other jurisdictions. Meanwhile, we are struggling to maintain our staffing in the face of terrible nationwide rhetoric against our honorable profession. Despite all that, as the county executive mentioned, it's notable that while crime increases around us, Anne Arundel County police officers have held back that tide and we have decreased crime in this county. We've made great progress digging out of the hole created by previous administration's failure to invest in public safety, but there is still more work to be done. We have facilities that are overdue for replacement and reinvestment, such as our truly abysmal firearms range. This is where our county law enforcement officers train on how to make legal and moral decisions about using deadly force, and it's really long overdue for a replacement. We have other initiatives that are in great need of support, such as our technology programs and our mental health programs. Uh, and these, these things should not be mistaken with spending. As the county executive called it, this is investment, investment in the safety and security of our communities, and it pays dividends in so many ways. It's uh, vitally important that we have the support of our citizens and our elected officials in the rhetoric and legislation, and of course, as we're here tonight in the county budget. I'm sure that it's our collective hope that all, all of our elected officials recognize and remember the vital role that public safety continues to play in making Anne Arundel County the best place for all. And we thank everybody for their support. Thank you, Mike. Next we have Ms. Rodriguez. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Hello everyone. My name is Asia Rodriguez and I am a county council resident of District 1. For my public testimony, I'd like to share how I don't want tax increases or fee increases. Anne Arundel County received funds from both the federal and state government that were included in this year's budget, the one-time payments. How do you plan on addressing the potential shortfall in future budgets without raising taxes? Will you address inflation in the budget? Given the last two years of structural deficit, we need to reduce government spending. On the county website, we have an online budget tool that can show us how revenues will be increased but not how we can reduce spending. So with that structural deficit in mind, can you have that feature improved to allow the online budget tool to see how that is possible? In regards to educa education, how are you going to fund the additional costs that will be acquired as a result of the Kerwin bill passing? Are you raising taxes to do that? I want to see a budget that does not burden minority women who are single income earners trying to make it in the world right now. Councilwoman Lacey, you mentioned that you look forward to funding the Affordable Housing Trust Fund that was authorized with the override of House Bill 933. While I understand that there are some people who own houses over a million dollars in our district who don't need to worry about affordable housing, it's the people who currently reside in affordable housing and are trying to enter the housing market who would be disproportionately affected. A tax surcharge on transactions of a million dollars or more would hit commercial real estate especially hard, including multifamily apartments. It's possible that the middle and low income individuals who reside in these commercial homes are going to inherit the, um, this tax increase. This would impact some of our most vulnerable communities, our black indigenous people of color. 
If you want to improve the quality of life in District 1, please address these concerns without raising taxes or passing legislation that will leave the people you claim to care about with the bill. Also, consider legislation that safeguards these funds to the Housing Trust actually go toward affordable housing initiatives. Thank you so much and have a nice night. Thank you, Asia. Uh, the next two we have are Ashley and Brian. Um, those are the only two hands that are raised. So if there's anyone else who would like to ask, um, who would like to give a comment, please um, use the raise hand function. So next up we have Ashley. Good evening. My name's Ashley Rogers and I'm the branch manager of the Severn Library. I'm testifying this evening in support of the library's budget, as well as to ask for your support on a critical supplemental request. First, I want to take the opportunity to thank Councilwoman Lacey and the County Exec for their support of our libraries. We are very grateful for the Local Development Council funds that have been used to renovate the Severn Branch and to fund our upcoming branch outreach vehicle that will serve our Severn neighborhoods. Over the past year, we have engaged our customers where they are by putting up story walks and parks, participating in food drives to share library info, and holding programs in neighborhoods, including a pop-up summer at your library series at a, the local Boys and Girls Club. Um, special thanks to Mr. Pittman for attending one of those. But we really need to take this a step further and engage in this work across the county with more dedicated resources for the long term. So we are asking for your support of our proposal for a Center for Community Engagement, a countywide outreach initiative that will seek to reach people where they are. One of the center's main goals is to increase kindergarten readiness. Libraries have been teaching early literacy skills for decades. Over the past year, so even during the pandemic, almost 47,000 people attended early literacy programs. We believe the center will build upon our past success and impact, impact kindergarten readiness by reaching people where they are. Additionally, the center has a huge opportunity to provide other services and programs that are requested by our customers, such as internet access and computer assistance. We've asked for 4.1 million for 3,000 square feet of space, staff, and eight vehicles. We can also start smaller, though the full impact will be with the complete proposal being funded. So I just wanna thank you both for your consideration and your continued support of our library system. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Next up, we have Brian. Hello, this is Brian uh, representing the Anne Arundel County Professional Firefighters Association. And thank you again for, for having us. Um, we wanna first acknowledge uh, the challenging year that, uh, that everyone's had. Um, our firefighters uh, have been proud and it's been our privilege to serve uh, each and every one of you through the pandemic. Um, and we know the struggles um, that, that people have had. Um, and we want you to know that we're still here for you and we'll still be on the streets, uh, you know, just like the police said, uh, 24 seven, 365. Um, one of the reasons we had a lot of success in this county in, um, uh, in fighting the pandemic was the investment uh, made uh, in, in uh, personal protective equipment um, and firefighters, EMTs, and paramedics, even before we knew that there was going to be a uh, pandemic. And that is to the great credit of County Executive Pittman uh, and County Councilwoman Lacey. Um, it really did uh, make all the difference. But that being said, uh, the pandemic's brought on um, new responsibilities for our department. Um, we've been tasked with, um, you know, doing vaccines, and um, you know, again, that's something we're very proud of. I think's made a huge difference. But and also our, our mobile health unit that now goes out into the community to meet people where they are and help facilitate them and the primary care physician uh, to take care of their health needs outside of the hospital setting, uh, which we know is so so overtaxed right now literally saving the taxpayers uh, and the hospitals uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, but like I said, the pandemic's really taken the wind out of us. Uh, we've had people retire early and leave um, because uh, they're just burnt out. And we are desperate to replenish uh, our ranks, especially our advanced life support paramedics. Uh, Chief Wolford uh, has a plan in her budget and we sincerely hope uh, that our elected officials uh, and our citizens will continue to support um, uh, the investment in our in public safety and in the fire department. Um, and again, uh, we thank you uh, for everything that you do every day. Thank you, Brian. The next three up are M. Ford, Lisa Aerosmith, and Cindy Williams. 
Um, M. Ford, you're next. I'm sorry. We just heard you. Can you unmute, please? I did. There you go. There we go. Hi, my name is Marnie Ford. I'm the treasurer of North Lincoln Improvement Association. Um, I'd like to first thank Councilwoman Lacey and Anne Arundel County for including Overlook Park in the park reno, reno budget for fiscal year 2022. This project included the much needed renovations for the tennis courts, basketball courts, the installation of a new irrigation system and the current renovations for the newly installed dog park to be open spring 2022. We want to thank legislative aide Linda Harris for all of her help answering our questions and for the attention that she gives to our community. And lastly, we want to thank the Department of Rec and Parks, Director Jessica Lays and Mark Garrity and all those who made these wonderful renovations possible. We received a lot of positive feedback from the North Linthicum community and the Overlook Park upgrades are definitely appreciated. Um, North Linthicum Improvement Association has a parcel of property deeded from Anne Arundel County inside the park. And we'd like to ask for assistance from the county in fiscal year 2023 budget to help fund the building of a small community center. Due to the pandemic, we are no longer able to hold our monthly meetings at Overlook Elementary School. So this valuable space could be used for that purpose as not everyone is able to Zoom and for use of activities and events to help bond our community. We would like to ask for possible, if still available, to provide residents in North Lincoln with trash receptacles. It was brought up at a recent meeting, and we just wanted to see if this could be done. We wanted to thank you, um, County Executive Pittman, um, Councilwoman Sarah Lacey, and everyone in the county for the attention they've given North Lincoln and Overlook Park this year. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Next up, we have Lisa Aerosmith. Good evening. My name is Lisa Aerosmith, and I'm the chair of the Public Water Access Committee. I live here in District 1, as I've done for more than 30 years. And I'm here to basically um, ask for more public swimming facilities and to build out some master plans for parks that have lingered for years. First, I would like to ask that Mayo Beach Park, the county's best public swimming beach, be open to the public every day of the year, but especially during the swim season. Uh, the Department of Health monitors about 70 swimming beaches in the county. I need less than the fingers on one hand to count the public ones. Mayo Beach Park should be open every day of the year to the public that owns it. Second, I would like to talk about the American Rescue Plan funding and ask that this one-time um, fund be used to build out the 2009 Master Plan for Weinberg Park, the 2018 Master Plan for South River Farm Park, and the 2018 Master Plan for Mayo Beach Park. Um, I want to kind of hark back to the Great Depression when President Roosevelt created the Civilian Conservation Corps and the Works Progress Administration to employ people and give hope in those times. Um, and the result is still, you know, structures in Patapsco Valley State Park along the Shenandoah and all over the country as a tangible legacy of hope in a time of darkness. You know, that could be repeated with these funds and these three parks to give, you know, public health benefits now and use in the future. And taking off my public, I would also like to ask that the uh, swim center in Provinces Park be funded so people can learn to swim. And last, taking off my water access committee hat, I would like that we have a sidewalk on Ridge Chapel Road in front of, front of Hebron Harbin's um, school. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Next up, we have Cindy Williams. Good evening. I'm Cindy Williams, um, president of the Provinces Civic Association. Provinces is a uh, large community in Severn, which is in the western part of the county. Um, I have two things I'd like to mention. Uh, first is the Watershed Protection and Restoration Grants. 
Um, I would really like the county to um, up the amount of grant, uh, grant money that's available for those types of projects. Um, I, I know in our community, we have a, a terrible uh, stormwater management problem. It needs to be uh, have a total retrofit and um, it's going to cost us $4 million, which of course we need a grant for. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the stormwater management in our community is so bad, it's polluting the Severn Run and the Severn River. Um, we really need to get this fixed. So we really need some more money in that, in that uh, grant program. Uh, and the other thing I'd like to mention is the uh, West County Swim Center that has been proposed to go in at the Provinces Park. Uh, the Provinces community is very concerned about putting a, a large swim center like that in our, right next to our community. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, we're worried about traffic issues and, um, uh, you know, taking away the, uh, the existing facilities that are there, the walking parks, the, the fields. Um, we don't like that either. Uh, we, we hope you could would consider putting it somewhere else. We do need a swim center, but it's that's not really a good location. Besides the fact that the uh, Parks and Recs promised the province's community years ago when they put the park in first at first that they would not ever put lights in the province's park, and now you're proposing a large swim center with uh, it would have to have outside lights. So thank you. Thank you, Cindy. It seems like Sandy German has, is the last person to raise her hand. So if there's anyone else who would like to ask a question, please use the raise hand function. Sandy, you can um, unmute yourself and ask her and make your comment, please. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Well, thanks for giving me a chance to speak. And I know this is like beating a dead horse, but I would really like to know what the plans are for the Ferndale and the Fern Glen Manor area that has been neglected for many years. I brought it to your attention. The businesses are failing. We have a shopping center that is more than half vacant. Some of the businesses are closing at two o'clock in the afternoon. One of the owners was shot. Uh, the Wendy's has closed. There's constant traffic back and forth, people injured. And it's like we we haven't gotten any help from anyone in the county. And I've I've asked for this before they, the elections, during the election, and now we're heading into another election. And I still have businesses that are questionable running. How are they running without proper permits? That money for the permits and license is what helps give revenue back to the county. So I don't understand why we keep allowing this to continue. So on behalf of the community, I would like to know what the plans are to help this community get, get itself back, make it beautiful, make it clean and make it inviting. It's not inviting anymore. People come in and you see these questionable businesses in a dying shopping center that's half fallen apart. Would you really wanna make this the best place for all? Is this what, this is the best you have to offer. So I, on behalf of this community, I think it's time that someone really addresses the concerns and the safety issues that surround all of these businesses and the questionable activity and the neglect that's been taking place over the last few years. Thank you for giving me the chance to speak. Thank you, Sandy. It seems like that's our last raise hand. So um, I'm doing one last call. If anyone has a comment they would like to make, please raise your hand. If not, I will turn it back to you, Mr. Pittman, for your closing remarks. Sir, you're on mute. All right. Well, thanks everybody for all of that. I'm still taking notes here. Um, um, I'll go through a few of these uh, that are of particular interest. Um, I um, 
Sandy German was the last to speak, and and I was up there recently um, with her and talked with her and one business owner about um, what revitalization could look like. And and I know that um, Sandy, you have said that you have concerns about any new buildings being built, and that that's not the solution. But um, the kind of revitalization I think you're talking about, it might be worth joining us next week. We have um, in Glen Burnie a town hall about that very topic, um, just down the BNA Boulevard from you, um, where we are looking at some redevelopment and some revitalization down there. And I think um, listening in on that, um, you might might come to the to the uh, conclusion that um, a little further up the road we could do something similar. And uh, and because we can't really tell businesses um, that they have to stay open, we can't tell them when they have to close or stay open. Um, so it's going to have to be um, a bigger effort, I think, um, to do community revitalization, and it's going to mean some new businesses and um, um, some some redevelopment, probably, to be able to to bring things back. Um, thanks, Gina Stewart, um, BWI Partnership for advocating for public transportation and for the the shuttle that you all run. Um, anybody who doesn't know the BWI Partnership, it's it's a lot of the the businesses in particular that are around. The airport, and um, it's a it's a thriving area that we want to continue to improve, and and we have great employers there, and we need to make sure that people can get to those jobs from all over the county. Um, animal care and control, um, y'all are at all the budget town halls, and um, and uh, you've brought up some things each year um, that we've funded at least in part, um, and now we've got on the list full time veterinarian, livestock trailer, dental services. And starting to look at the big the big question about um, whether that shelter long term is a real solution and whether we need to make start making a plan for a more modern shelter, and um, you know my heart is with you and um, and I feel as though the most vulnerable among us are where we need to focus and animals included. So um, we have work to do there with you. Um, always love hearing from our um, our police uh, fraternal order of police as well as our firefighters union. Um, speaking on behalf of the brave men and women that that serve us in police and fire, and um, you can be sure that we will be um, um, always focused on you in the budget and uh, making sure that you're able to protect our residents. Um, uh, we did have one one person, and I was glad to hear somebody talking about reducing spending and and um, trying to make sure that uh, government doesn't get bloated and inefficient. Um, and that's the way I look at it as a business person. I don't feel that reducing services is the answer that we want to serve the public and the public is telling us in these town halls what we need to do. And we do have great needs to be met, but we have to do it efficiently and absolutely keeping our taxes among the lowest. Um, none of the central Maryland large counties have taxes as low as ours and we want to keep it that way. Um, and um, on the affordable housing trust fund that Councilwoman Lacey was referring to, um, I think the bill that that you were talking about was a state bill that authorizes us to be able to use as a source of funding for that trust fund, the real estate transfer tax if we increased it on properties above a million dollars to create a, a set aside for that. Um, we specifically exempted multifamily affordable housing from that because some of those buildings um, are, are over a million dollars. Um, but that's not necessarily, there would have to be council legislation to move that forward. And we can do a housing trust fund with any source of revenue, um, any source of funding that we choose to use. And it's a high priority for me as well as Councilwoman Lacey to move that forward. Um, I love the fact that our libraries are working on kindergarten readiness. And um, I always am ready to work with our libraries on improving services because they are like our community centers and their value to our communities is, is generally underestimated. And um, we need to continue to invest there. Um, Marnie Ford, thank you for thanking the staff, thanking Rec and Parks, thanking Constituent Services and, and um, um, the Councilwoman's um, um, staff as well um, for Overlook Park and all the other work that they do. Um, that's a great way to start when you're advocating for more. So <laughs> you were heard um, and will continue to be. And um, on water access, Lisa Aerosmith has been a longtime advocate. And, and um, I do intend to, um, to really start looking more comprehensively at a master plan. We have to find properties where we can increase um, water access by acquiring them. Um, we also have to invest in the infrastructure that we have. Um, Mayo Beach Park 
Um, I would love to have it open every day, but we want to keep the camp there that's there on the summer weekend days. Um, but when they're not there, yeah, we want to have it open to the public. Um, and and um, if there are additional days that that it, it, it could be opened, um, I'm certainly open to looking at that, um, as well as some of the other sites that you talked about. Um, Swim Center uh, is in the budget at Provinces Park, and it's been a long time finding the right location. So I I, I know that the Rec and Parks team is going to have to work with the community on trying to um, make sure that it benefits the community and, and meets the needs of the, the local community as well as the broader area. Um, and it was also good to hear somebody asking for more watershed protection restoration program grants. They um, Their budget is based on what they get in the watershed protection, the, the fees, the stormwater fees. But now we have the resilience authority that can also fund similar kinds of uh, flood mitigation. And so there can be some overlap there. And there is also likely to be some federal assistance for some of that as well. Um, so we're hoping to be able to, to increase grants in that area. So that's everything that I want to talk about. <laughs> I'm talking too long. Um, Councilwoman Lacey, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy, executive. Um, I think your summary is excellent. I don't um, have very much to add to it, except um, on the stormwater management um, I know we have the resilience um, resilience authority that we just created, but we do also have the PPI fund, the permanent public improvements fund, and maybe there is a way we can look at of doing a a sort of a stopgap um, if necessary before we're you know as able to use the resilience dollars resiliency dollars that we're planning to be able to use, but we're not quite ready to use them yet on some of the projects like uh, the Lake Marion renovation, for example, which is probably too small for the resiliency authority, but also it's definitely too big for what's in our normal stormwater management. And I think we should, uh, you know, hopefully um, outside the budget process, take a look at um, more comprehensively reviewing how we might cover stormwater management improvements, because um, that infrastructure is going to be really important for a long time to come. So, um, and the final thing I wanted to add is uh, just to mention for those of you who are um, watching what's happening with Mead High School, um, which is being renovated right now. Um, it's got a huge renovation underway. I think it's more than $100 million. Um, and uh, the thing about that is it's not county money. So I wasn't going to bring it up during uh, during the budget town hall, but it's, I think, $110 million investment of federal dollars, very much needed, very much appreciated, and is part of overall increased um, investment in the community or the communities, I should say, around uh, Fort Meade. And with that, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. I've got lots of notes and everyone can follow up with me uh, by, you know, by email if you'd like. All right, thanks everybody for joining us tonight.